So now uh, Michael Bechanik will talk about the periodic integration buildings and BTS invariants. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation to give this talk. And uh, it's really been a, a blast of our great, great conference. I really enjoyed it. So I'm going to talk about uh, try and work with uh, Dimitri Wies and uh, Paul Ziegler. And so first of all, I want to uh, address uh, common misconceptions of periodic integration, despite the name, is actually just regular or classical integration theory. Uh, A, a real value, or maybe even complex value function. But the space you're integrating on is of periodic nature. So on something like QP, it could also be QP points of an algebraic variety. So to be honest, that's uh, really the, the framework we're really working on. But yeah, it really is just uh, classical integration theory. Just like we, we learn it in, in undergrad, like on a, on a measure space that is related to the chaotic numbers. And uh, there's a, a sister theory, a motivic integration, which was uh, introduced by, by Konsevich. And so this one is kind of a, a more uh, exotic version of integration theory. So here you're kind of integrating. Uh, of course, it's inspired by classical integration theory, but the integrating uh, in a different ring. So the integrals will not land in, in the real numbers, but actually it will ring, land in, in, in Konsevich style uh, motifs. So something like the K theory, the group and the group of varieties. Then you have to localize and, and complete. So there's some kind of more complicated integration. But it, it's a beautiful theory. And it has the advantage that um, everything you do happens over the complex numbers, if you're inclined to work there. So that's definitely appealing uh, for, for complex geometers. While in this theory, you kind of have to leave uh, the world of complex numbers and work over more exotic rings like uh, Finite fields and the piadics, or maybe finite extensions of the piadics. Um, but it's kind of, you know, it's a it's a personal choice. You kind of have to decide whether you want to integrate in a classical way, or you want to, or if you want to integrate in a new way and stay over the complex numbers. So everything I say uh, possibly has a motivic analog. Um, some of the things I'll, I'll comment on during the talk, and other things might be worked out in the future. Uh, maybe by us, maybe by a different team of authors. Who knows? But just to keep that in mind, that if you, if you find the piadics uh, an outlandish object, then you can also uh, replace QP by something like formal Laurent series over the complex numbers. And whenever I say uh, set P in your head, you could replace it by a formal power series. So that's kind of the, the, the trade off that happens when it switches between periodic integration and motivic integration. And so, in particular, in motivic integration, we study chats of arcs, arcs on, a, on a variety rather than periodic points. And so, this is kind of the, the geometric idea that I would like you to, to keep in mind. And then the, the next question. So in spite of me working kind of mostly in periodic integration today, I kind of want to address why, um, why should we do this? So first of all, uh, what's the point of, of switching, switching fields? Let's say we only care about uh, things happening over the complex numbers. Actually, I'm gonna go <laughs> to that part. So let's say I only care about uh, the complex numbers. Why should I ever go and work? with another field. Well, I guess there's a close connection. Let's say that X is smooth and protective. But then there's a close connection between a singular cohomology 
of x and uh, point counting of a finite field. So the complex number is one of the most basic things that you have to study the well, kind of the shape of a variety is its uh, cohomology, of course, in all uh, its different classes. And <laughs> surprisingly, this basic invariant is related to another one of arithmetic nature. If you can uh, reduce your variety mod p, so of course we can always do that in a kind of a, an arbitrary way. If the variety is defined over the complex numbers, we kind of choose a so-called spreading out. Just choose the smaller string that contains all the coefficients needed to define the variety. And then this string, you know, can map to something like FQ. So we can always reduce uh, mod p, but it somehow, you know, it was a lot of choices. But yeah, as uh, was shown by, by Deligne and the Grotenik school and Torque, I guess, there's a very precise link, uh, which was conjectured by, by Weil, uh, the Weil conjectures, relating point counts with the the cohomology of the variety. And so now this is already a, a very good reason for a complex geometer to work with finite fields once in a while. Uh, for instance, um, a good example would be this tam paper by, by Tamash and uh, Fernando Rodriguez Villegas, where they use uh, point counts of character varieties to compute the polynomials of, of character varieties. So if you drop the condition that X is moving projective, there's still a very precise uh, connection between point counts and E polynomials. And so by the way, um, so the, I mentioned the weight conjectures. So they only give you the Betty numbers a priori. So if you understand the point counts, you can compute the Betty numbers using uh, the theta function. But in fact, there's a, well, a more uh, kind of complicated relationship that if you know sufficiently many point counts, let's say for, all, for almost all prime numbers um, and almost all field extensions, then actually you can also compare have Hodge numbers or you can, compute the Hodge numbers of the, the complex variety. So this is kind of a, a more complicated relationship that hinges on some work of Fontaine and then Faltings, uh, namely so-called Piadic Hodge theory. So I'm, I'm mentioning this today, but uh, let me just say the Piadic Hodge theory uh, doesn't really have any direct relationship to Piadic integration, despite the fact that you often see the two theories cited in the, the same papers. Um, so this is given by the, the weight contractors with the theorem. And so this is given by, by Piadi Cotta theory, which uh, recently has seen a, a fascinating renaissance uh, by, the, by the work of, of Button and Schultz. And yeah, and their school. Okay, so now that I hopefully convinced you that counting points of a finite field is uh, useful and good. The question is, how do we do it? And so that's where getting integration enters the picture. So if you want the kind of way of reading this diagram would be kind of in this direction usually. That's how, uh, at least in our work, the flow of ideas goes. So we kind of, we prove some statement here of the piadics. This tells us something about point counting. And then uh, this allows us to infer something about uh, the cohomology of complex varieties. And so here in periodic integration, so you're working over this mysterious field QP, I'm going to say more about it later, but this is a local field. So there's a, a well-behaved uh, integration theory, which is just given by essentially the harm measure of this local field. So it's a locally compact non-discrete field. And so point counting will correspond to integration. So there will be a canonical measure if the variety is defined over the set P. So bear in mind that I, I have the standing assumption of the smoothness and the projectivity. And so you see here, the, the difference is essentially that we're replacing cohomology first by point counting and then uh, point counting by uh, an integral. And so now why, why is this interesting? Um, well, it becomes quite useful if you want to show that two varieties, for some abstract reason, have the same cohomology or the same point count. And so that's the first instance uh, 
unaware of the uh, that periodic integration was used that way. I think the theory itself was probably introduced by Andre Weil again, uh, not in the context of his weight contractors, but he had his fingers in a lot of pies. So, so the first application of this theory, it's a complex geometry was given by Batyalev, and he showed that if x and y are irrational uh, Calabiaos, then actually they have the same uh, Hodge numbers. So he, he stated it for active numbers. But it, it does imply, as was, no, as was noticed by Ito, Um, so this is like a combination of their, their work that they have the same Hodge numbers. And so this is precisely an application of this, this result. And so the, the argument of Patinov in a, in a nutshell is that, well, if they're rational, this means that they are isomorphic away from, from co-dimension two. And so now if you pass to periodic points, uh, proper subvarieties have measure zero. So this is somehow an aspect of periodic integration that looks sounds a bit like the promised land. So you don't like a part of the variety, it's okay, just throw it away. Well, you can almost ignore it, it's a, it's a measure zero. That's exactly what happened in this argument. Of course, it's a bit more subtle because it's not true that all the rational varieties have the same periodic volume. And that's the case because the volume or the measure is controlled by the canonical divisor. But now if you have the assumption that the rational color be out, this means that the canonical divisor is the same. And so the measures can actually, uh, they actually match up on the part that you can compare. And so you get this equality of periodic integrals essentially for free. And so this then implies an equality of point counts, which then implies an equality of petty numbers and via the Cox theory also uh, of the Hodge numbers. And so then in, in our work, um, we applied this first to give a proof of this uh, conjecture by, by Hausel and Tellius, a topological mirror symmetry conjecture. And the reason why it works in a nutshell is the following, that um, there's a version of all of this for all default homology. So let's say that, um, X is a sort of a, a smooth projective orbifold. Let me write it like this. Which is a finite group. And so then I can define the stringy or the orbifold cohomology of X. And so I'm going to leave some, some space here um, intentionally because there's also a version uh, with chirps and that version is actually important for, for mirror symmetry. And it's given by following direct sum indexed by, by conjugacy classes in the group G. So G is a finite group. But here you just take the, the fixed point locus and divide by the centralizer. So you take the fixed point locus of the representative of the conjugacy class and you divide by the rest of the group that selects on it. So that's the, the centralizer. And then there's a, a tape twist, mysterious tape twist, uh, which is related to the fermionic shift. So in the physical literature and in the paper by, by uh, Thomas and Michael, it's called the fermionic shift. It's also related to sort of like weight functions that you see in the Obifold literature or the H function. And so as I said, in this paper, there's a, there's a chirp that plays an important role. It's actually needed for the statement to be true. And so yeah, the chirp is really just an element of the, the Brouwer group, and if that doesn't sound familiar, then you can also say that it's an element of H2 of X in 
a group of, of fruits of unity. And but I usually work with the et al. Uh, topology when defining these cohomology groups. But you can also work complex analytically. So if you define this complex analytically, you won't lose out on, on anything. Or if you want, you can also think of it as an S1 chirp. That's actually a perspective taken in uh, House and Tedius. And so now this chirp uh, induces on those fixed point uh, loci a flat unitary bundle or rank one like local system. And essentially, you just take the cohomology of that. And so this is kind of the the, the obvious cohomology corrected by the by the chirp. And so there's a there's a point count analog of this. So there's a over finite fields you can define an, an orbifold orbifold point count, which again will be a sort of of sum indexed by conjugacy classes if your finite field is big enough. Otherwise, you have to take into account some, some problem with Galois actions that you can correct that quite easily. And so there's a similar formula. So you kind of, you essentially, you see point counts. So I'm going to write this approximately. Uh, you see point counts from these uh, fixed point loci quotient set by um, the centralizer. And then if you do the, the chirp version, uh, certain weights, so there will be, it will be a sort of weighted point count. So each point in this uh, fixed point locus might have a different weight, uh, which um, again is related to these uh, dynamic shifts into the chirp. So it's kind of a combination of a weighted point count and there's some kind of character, there's some character sums popping up. And now if you pass to periodic integration, uh, we observed that you can actually express this simply as an integral. So previously, cohomology was related to the volume. And so now uh, this orbifold cohomology twisted by the chirp is just given by an integral that is associated to, to the chirp. So somehow taking something abstract like a chirp in periodic integration becomes a function which is almost everybody finds on the cross modelized space. And this will really just be a, a complex valued function. So where H alpha takes values in uh, invertible complex numbers, and it's almost everywhere defined. And so the, the definition is that you associate to a point, to a periodic point, the exponential of two pi i times uh, the Hasse invariant of the chirp at this point x. And so the, what's behind all of this is this kind of classical description of Hasse of the Brouwer group of a non-Archimedean local field. So this could be QP, if you want. It could also be a formal Laurent series of a, of a finite field. It cannot be the real numbers or the complex numbers, then you get something different, you get something easier. And so Hasse computed that, that this was just given by uh, the following quotients, so essentially portion points on the, the unit circle, if you want, right? So this is really just given by, by torsion points. On the unit circle. And so that's the kind of embedding that we use to, to produce this argument here that we integrate. What we call cohomology is, is it like a Hodge? Uh, yeah, 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 there's a, yeah, the Hodge structures too, yeah. But what about the twisting? You're twisting by a Tate module or what is Oh, yeah, exactly. That's, um, yeah, here's the Tate twist. Yeah, exactly. You can, actually, there, there should also be a shift. If you write it down, like you don't see the, the shift in. Kind of the, and so, yeah, it's, it's a sort of a fractional Tate twist, actually. So the, the weight function is actually takes values in Q a priori. So for modelized spaces of fixed bundles, it's, it's always integral. And actually, the fermionic shift is given by half the co-dimension of the, the fixed bundle twist. 
is this like a, a functorial um, homology theory for overflows? Yeah. Fullbacks and yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe you have to be careful with what kind of maps, but yeah. Maybe not for all maps you get pullback for programs, but yeah, definitely for some. Okay. So can you just read for me yeah. what is the twist precisely? The fermionic, uh, yeah. the fermionic shift. So here, so actually the in, on the point cut level, this really just corresponds to some factor like this. You can multiply with the people. I, 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 <laughs> the problem is that I, yeah. I cannot read the formula. Yeah. And now the thing that you, you wrote. Yeah. It's even smaller. Yeah. It's it's a tricky situation. <laughs> yeah, I will work my board work. Okay. <laughs> I think it was stupid to only use half of the board and only create a half such <laughs> empty. But I, okay, I'll, I'll copy this. So here, um, so here you have you know, this homology thing, and then there's this uh, tape twist, and then there's also a shift. And what, what's inside the one? Hmm? It's the same as here. Uh, <laughs> 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 so you take the fixed point locus quotient by the centralizer, and then there's this local system, so this twisted sheet of coefficients given by the chart and used by the chart. I, I'm not going to explain today how to how to get it, but it's it's there. It's it's explained really well in, in the paper, the original paper by Hausman and Tedius. And then on the like the point count analog, like here essentially it's a sort of a weighted point count. So if you want, you can kind of uh, so this will be point count indexed by, by the inertia stack or the twisted inertia stack. And then each point contributes uh, essentially following things. So first of all, it contributes one over the order of the, the automorphism group in this funny twisted inertia stack. And then uh, there's this, this weight coming from the corresponding to the fermionic shift. And you have the value of the, the Hass invariant that a priori you can define for uh, periodic points, so F points, but you can also define it for the points of this twisted inertia stack over, over F cubes. So that's somehow. <clears throat> one of the things that we use. And so, yeah, this is the, the sort of thing that you get on the, the point counting thing. So then periodic integration is probably the easiest to remember because here you're really just integrating. In the course modelized space, um, this function corresponding to the, to the chirp, the Hass invariant. So yeah, this is somehow uh, nice and compact, but it really like if you compute what it is, it's it's just the same thing as that up to a constant. And then if you if you know all those all those point counts using the, the usual magic provided by the veil and the periodic periodic Koch theory, you get actual comparison statements like only on the numerical level, like the Hodge numbers, the default Hodge numbers. So this is essentially in a nutshell um, one of the things that made us realize that. A periodic integration should be useful for saying something about the Hausel Tedius uh, conjecture. And then the other thing being that um, there's a sort of a, a trick that makes it relatively easy to compare periodic volumes for spaces endowed with uh, dual vibrations. So Like the Hitchin vibration. So I've worked on the Hitchin vibration a long time and it's a beautiful gadget, but wouldn't it be nice if every fiber was moved? Wouldn't that be great? I mean, every paper would be a lot easier, right? <laughs> and so <clears throat> somehow a lot of the technical problems arise when you have to deal with uh, smooth fibers, like understanding the, the cohomology. And of course, a very efficient tool is given by the, the support theorem by Engel Bao Chao that allows one to reduce the study of the singular locus to a very particular type of singularities like nodal, which is much easier to deal with. 
And so that's a, a very beautiful idea and trick. And so in PRD integration, um, which is of course applicable to a much smaller class of, of results, but in a certain, certain circumstances, it actually allows you to reduce everything to the smooth locus. You can just forget about the single agent fibers. And um, the argument is roughly the following. So you want to show that um, the volumes of the modelized spaces of these kind of dual Hitchin systems agree. And so that's very, very simple once you, you take uh, some chirps into account. So essentially, what we have is that over these local fields, uh, the integral of the resulting Hass invariance uh, match up. And so this is kind of the general version. <coughs> And so let's say we are in the, in the situation that we have a, a hitch in cost section. Then in fact, you really just get a comparison of, of volumes. So you don't even have to work with, with chirps. And so of course, in order to apply, uh, apply these things, we, we need some assumptions on the, on the stack. So we, we actually want to work with, uh, um, smooth, uh, really Mumford stacks. And then there's also, uh, a tameness assumption that is needed. And then in the paper, we, we also had this assumption that this move to the Mumford stacks were actually Tsarisky locally quotients. This, this assumption is not needed anymore. So this was recently removed by my student, Peter Angelinos. So now you can just assume that you're working with uh, tame and uh, smooth telemantled stacks. And so now the, the upshot is you, you get this uh, equivalence of volumes as an application of, of Fubini essentially. So you want to say, okay, let's compute the volume of uh, this space. Well, I just write it as an integral of the volume of the fibers, of the hidden fibers. And the same thing on this side. And so now up to a set of measure zero, all the hidden fibers are smooth because uh, so proper subvarieties happen to have measure zero in, with respect to this periodic volume. And so now this allows you to discard the fibers we don't understand. And uh, it so happens that it's actually a classical theorem, which was stated differently without the formalism of periodic integration. But it's a, a classical statement that dual abelian varieties of a local field have the same volume in an appropriate sense. So this is usually stated as a comparison of Kamakawa numbers. And so now you see that. Using Fubini, you actually get a comparison of, of volumes, like the, the volumes of the fibers match up due to duality. And then like if you work in the actual in the version with the chirp, this is some kind of character sum trick. So some some fibers might actually be not abelian varieties, but torsos under abelian varieties, if you work in kind of a, like a degree non-zero and non-zero degree situation. And then so those fibers will disappear when you take the volumes because they will be. The corresponding set will be empty of that points. But then on the other side, we get a character sum that leads to cancellation. So somehow the, the role of the chirp is actually to uh, annihilate the volume of the fibers that don't have a matching counterpart on the other side because of the, the torsor structure. Okay, so at the end of the day, it's a, like a very simple elementary argument that gives you comparison either of volumes or comparison of the integrals of these chirps under some appropriate uh, duality assumptions. And then, of course, um, we can use this formula to relate the, the integrals to um, these orbifold point counts. 
So here we get a comparison of, of all these volcanic fronts uh, with the with the chart, if you want. Oh, I, I just noticed that I, I forgot to put it anywhere here. Okay, so this is the the orbital point count with the with the chirp. So now here we get a comparison of these uh, these point counts. What is, is there a geometric interpretation of this orbital point count? Yeah, exactly. So in, in in order to prove the house and Tavius conjecture, that's essentially all you need because it's like the point counts, the orbital point counts directly relate uh, to orbital cohomology. So if, if we are just interested in, in the proof of house and Tavius, that's that's good enough. So comparing those orbital point counts for sufficiently many finite fields gives us a comparison of the Hodge numbers, the orbital Hodge numbers. But then um, in our second paper where we um, uh, gave a, an alternative proof of uh, this theorem by Engel Bao Chao, geometric stabilization, which uh, implies the, the fundamental lemma, we actually used that orbifold cohomology, orbifold point counts have a very explicit interpretation in terms of point counts for other modelized spaces of fixed bundles. And those uh, modelized spaces of fixed bundles actually related to endoscopic groups. So, so that's essentially the other thing that we, that we use is that the inertia stack, if you want, of the model I stack of GX bundles that was considered by NGO, so it's called the MG tilde. So this is some certain ital cover, some kind of W cover for the Y group. So you make some additional choices and this is somehow yeah, related to how these endoscopic loci intersect. You also take a, an appropriate, a similar cover of the, the Hitchin base, mm -hmm. um, but we may kind of ignore it for now but to, for the sake of keep, keeping the exposition short. And it also like in our conventions, it also implies that we work over the so-called elliptic locus. So this is important in order to get uh, the dilly manfold uh, condition. Otherwise, if you work with a full Hitchin base, we don't have uh, dilly manfold stacks. We get something more complicated, even uh, not a finite type. And so we would have to use stability conditions and so on. <clears throat> but yeah, this is kind of the, the same uh, stack of fixed bundles that is considered in, in this paper by Engel Bao Chao on the fundamental lemma. And so the interpretation is that the inertia stack, so you could just say inertia stack if if your finite field is big enough, can be written as an explicit uh, disjoint union of other modelized spaces of Higgs bundles, where the Langlands dual of H is uh, an endoscopic group of the Langlands dual of G. So now essentially using this identity that you establish with PFA integration, the, the comparison of the volumes for GX bundles and the Langlands tool, GX bundles, you get immediately from this comparison another identity that you kind of of that nature, where you see that you have somehow point counts of the endoscopic groups appear on both sides. So now you have this H prime. So here the Langlands tool of H is an endoscopic group, the Langlands tool of G. So this is the side corresponding to G, the G side. And then on the dual side, you have that uh, the Langlands tool of H prime is an endoscopic group of. Uh, so each one is a subgroup. Is uh, the Langlands zero of H is a subgroup of the Langlands zero of G? Um, yeah, exactly. So endoscopic groups are somehow defined in terms of uh, Langlands duality, but double Langlands duality. So, so, um, a so yeah, it, none of them is really a subgroup. But, I mean, those are really actual kind of group schemes over the curve, if you want. But some of the, the twists of so the Langlands tool of H. Um, no, sorry. So H 
is related to a centralizer group scheme in chi. And so it's some sort of yeah twisted version of that. And so this means that it's Langdon's dual is an endoscopic group of the, the Langdon tool. And so now then there are some additional factors which are related to the fermionic shift in our paper, but they're exactly the same Q powers that appear in the statement of the of geometric stabilization, which are related to the kind of the factors that you need in the statement of the fundamental lemma. Um, okay, and so essentially you get this identity, which um, already has a bit of a flavor of uh, geometric stabilization that kind of describes the relationship between the cohomology of G, a certain part of the cohomology of G, in terms of the cohomology of uh, HX bundles. And so essentially using this version here, introducing chirps, we can produce more identities of this type where you have some character sums appearing and then by, by summing those identities up, we, we end up with the kind of comparison of point counts that establishes uh, geometric stabilization. And so somehow in the entire argument, you, you don't have to actually refer to the theory of curvature sheaves or the decomposition theorem. So it's um, somehow, yeah, an alternative viewpoint. So now the question that we've been interested in since then is what happens in the absence of a smoothness and dilly mantle condition? Oh, yeah, I guess we can use this here. What happens if X is not a, a smooth uh, DM stack? And so by the way, I, I should have mentioned that. So uh, <laughs> after we proved the, the house of conjecture, in fact, the, the, the flurry of activities and many more proofs that were, were published. Um, so I think so important that it's it's work that there's also it's to mention that there's a parabolic version which was recently, recently proven by Shi Yu Shen, proving the TMS for, for parabolic Higgs bundles, and like prior work in the range two case existed too by, by Gotham and uh, Oliveira, and then in the original non-parabolic situation there's a motivic integration proof uh, worked out by Lösel and Wies, uh, so which works entirely over the complex numbers kind of using using those uh, arc spaces. And there's also a perverse sheaf proof uh, due to Molik and Shen. So just for time reason, I'm not writing down all these names, which is really exciting. So they use perverse sheaf, so uh, the decomposition and the support theorem due to Engel Bao Chao, and um, a vanishing cycle for a very interesting function of the model I uh, stack of things bundles uh, that they've discovered. And then there's also another version of Molik and Shen working within the framework of Bivotsky motives. So again, uh, those are motives in a different sense than in periodic than in motivic integration, kind of really a complicated triangulated category of, of motives. And so uh, this is worked out by uh, Hoskins and Pepin. Uh, so they give like a Wibowski motive uh, version of uh, Monique and Chance paper, which is really interesting. So that's the kind of the strongest comparison of uh, cohomological invariants of these modelized spaces to date. Um, okay. Right, so now, um, so the question kind of has fascinated us since then is what happens in the absence of uh, the smooth Gurley Manford condition. So, as I mentioned uh, in our second paper uh, on geometric stabilizations on Engel's theorem, we, we work on the elliptic locus, which guarantees uh, smoothness and the Gurley Manford property. And in the first paper on the Hausel Tellius conjecture, we work. Uh, under the assumption that rank and degree are co prime, which also guarantees that we get either a smooth modelized space for SLN Higgs bundles or a smooth Tillemanfeld stack for, for PG and Higgs bundles. And so now um, it's been you know, unclear for a while what to, what to expect in the smooth DM stack, uh, in, in the, sorry, in the non DM stack case of the Arting stacks. So, kind of the, the question. 
is a more precise question is the following. So let X be uh, an algebraic stack. And so this one, I'm going to assume to be smooth and then X the, the porous moduli space. So this, this will be singular in general. And then there should probably be some additional assumptions. That I needed to control the, the measure, but I'm, I'm going to, to ignore for now. Um, so it's not so difficult to construct uh, a measure, a canonical measure on, on the set of, uh, of OF points. So this would be uh, set P if you want. Or heuristically, in motivic integration, you would do this in some hard formal, formal arcs. So there's a there's a canonical measure that you can define on, on this course model I space. And the only question is what, what is the kind of the, the point count interpretation? Because it relates to, to point counts in a precise way. Is there a sort of a, does it allow us to reprove some kind of comparison of, of homology theories? And in the case where the X is uh, the model I stack of six bundles on a curve. I think to the, the course modelized space. It just would be sort of semi stable. Experiment on the curve. Um, one can do the following one can show that uh, getting integration, essentially using the same argument as previously using this kind of Fabini theorem. One can show that the, the periodic volume or this integral of the Huss invariant of the curves is actually independent of uh, the degree. So we can show that H alpha on X of OF is degree independent. And so this is um, something we, we did if R and D is co-prime. And then the, the general case uh, was worked out by, uh, by these, I'm uh, sorry, putting the order on, I think. Um, Kabochi, And, uh, and these, so you have this degree independence uh, of this, uh, this integral of the Huss invariant, which um, in fact, if R and T are co-prime and you're working with GLN Higgs bundles, then you, this really is just the volume. So this is the constant function in this case. And then you're just showing that the, the cohomology is degree independent. So this was actually a, another conjecture by, uh, by Tamash, which was also independently proven by, by Anton Mellet. So this independence of D in a different context. Is a theorem by, by Mellet. But so in any case, so having this degree independence, um, there's one cohomology theory that was rumored to be attached to modelized spaces like the modelized space of Higgs bubbles, which would also have this uh, degree independence property. And so that is uh, BPS cohomology.
is uh, degree phi independent. And so at the time when we were writing the first paper, um, at least to FPPS cohomology was still an extremely mysterious uh, object. Uh, but to me, it still is, to be honest. So I think it's safe to say that at least two thirds of the words in the title are kind of uh, gadgets I don't consider myself an expert on. Um, but yeah, BPS cohomology being one of them. And so now there's a very precise uh, description of BPS cohomology, of course, due to Kinshul uh, and Doseki, uh, who kind of proved by independence and describe EPS cohomology in terms of IC. Okay, so this was already something that Milko explained uh, in his talk a little bit, so kind of the various uh, sums of these IC homologies that need to be taken into account. What does BPS mean? I I can't tell you. I think it's something that comes from the physics literature. So that it's I think the BPS states. There's also like the Hilbert space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. That's what defines the guest cohomology. Yeah, but we're going to see a, a formula later on. Yeah. So this is sort of a, it involves sophisticated exponential. So once I'm going to state the the new theorem of this talk. We're going to I'm going to explain how it relates. So how we believe it relates to BPS homology. So just as a as a spoiler, we're not claiming a new proof of this result by Kincho and Konseki, which is at the moment we're just claiming that uh, for these singular moduli spaces, periodic volumes satisfy similar numerical identities that are related to so just like BPS homology. It's really the object. It's like a, it has a natural host structure. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? It's a gradient gain. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Is it uh, a graded ring? Well, if you take all the, well, it has graded things, right? It's a, it's a, it's a homology or something, yeah. But okay, it doesn't have a ring structure. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, it's not a ring. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. But it definitely has a gradient. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like they say, what it is, but I mean, you kind of you express it in terms of the IC cohomology of the, the cross moduli spaces, yeah. or, or moduli spaces of fixed numbers. But there are the chi dependencies proved in the Kuban case in Kinjo and Kozeki. Is it? I think so. Okay. Oh no, okay, for BPS cohomology in general. Okay, yeah. not for intersection. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're not doing great in time, to be honest. But yeah, um, what's the quickest way to, to get to the main theorem? Well, let's just say in the following setting we're working, um, we're working the following setting right now. Um, M is a moduli stack, smooth moduli stack, uh, semi stable objects in an abelian category. It could also be like a sheet of exact categories or something like this. And <clears throat> so this, this model I stack is essentially, if you want, you can think of it as taking the discrete union of the model I stack of fixed bundles for all ranks, but you're kind of fixing the slope. Yeah. Same, same slope. So it comes with a direct sum operation. And now all of what we're doing here, this will actually be over 
over a finite field, but we extend the abelian category, we assume that it lives uh, over something like the periodics. So if you want, uh, some kind of chat version of it that was given to you. So this will be important in order to define the periodic um, integrals. And so then we also have uh, uh, the course modelized space version of this. So this is the, the course modelized space. So again, here we're taking direct sums over all the of all the ranks if you want, if you're working with fixed bundles. So this will be a very big object, but it's uh, something we need in order to define some basic properties. And so then uh, on, this, uh, on this ring, you can define, um, sorry, on this monoid, you can define the, the counting functions. So those will be the following objects. So by the way, a lot of the things I'm presenting right now, uh, we learned from a paper by Vesage, uh, Moscow wide. And so this will be functions from M, Q to Vesage called uh, the counting the volume ring. So here we're taking essentially sequences. And then there's a sort of a natural uh, convolution product that one can define of all these counting functions. So F times G is defined as a, as a convolution product. And, So on, on these counting functions, we have the statistic operations. So we have statistic operations which are defined in the following way. Yes? Is there a question? And so, yeah. so when you write M of FQ, you mean isomorphic classes? And if it's not. Yeah, so in these, no, yeah, yeah, and and the other end is then sort of as equivalent to polystable objects, yeah, exactly, yeah. And so now this will be sort of the following so psi n of f of x if x is an n fold multiple with respect to the direct sum, and otherwise it's it's zero. And psi n of a series, sorry, a sequence, psi m is simply given by spacing out the sequence a little. So this is um, an Adam's operation that one needs. And then one can define on suitable ideals, one can define the, the statistic of operations. So one has this statistic a logarithm, sorry, exponential from CF0. So CF0 plus one. Those are simply functions that are zero on the unit with respect to this convolution product. And this exponential sends F to X of psi N of F divided by, by n. And then there's also a logarithm, which I'm just going to write down as a formula. So this will be kind of uh, interesting. Because some of the, the actual terms of the, the formula have a meaning. Uh, have an interpretation in chaotic integration. But now the, the main theorem of this talk, so this is still very much work in, in progress, is actually the, the following. So um, the statement is that there exists a, a specialization map from which is almost everybody defined. 
from OF points of dispersed moduli space to isomorphism classes of the stack. And so now if you if you complete, if you compute the the chaotic integral. of the inverse image of the specialization map of some object E. If you do this also for all kind of unramified extensions of, of Fn of this third alpha, so then this gives you a, a counting function. And so this counting function actually happens to be a statistic logarithm. So the counting function is equal to statistic logarithm of Almost a constant function. So this is somehow a much easier counting function. And so the appearance of this uh, statistic logarithm is what uh, you know makes us believe that uh, there's really somehow a local way of comparing PPS homologies, or this means uh, PPS sheaves, maybe, and uh, periodic integrals. Although again, this is very much work in progress. And the reason is that. PPS homology is defined in terms of what? Yes. Alpha here. The jerk in the peer before in the general setup. What, what, what do you mean it's in the peer before? In the setting, there is no jerk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the jerk is given by uh, richly defying. The stack of semi stables. So it's given by GM, essentially just GM automorphisms of every object. So this leads to another um, modelized stack, the retrodified version, which maps to the cross modelized space. And so the map from M to the retrodification that is uh, the chirp. That's the GM chirp. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to explain this. Again, there's a so essentially all these modelized spaces in practice usually can be expressed as a quotient by a PGLN action. And so if you want uh, this quotient by PGLN is, is inducing the, the chart. Just because PGLN tors also bundles induce uh, elements of the, the Brouwer group. And right, so now let me just quickly write down the formula for BPS homology so we can kind of See why this is some sort of local counterpart. We'll compare this with, and so here essentially that's the classical identity, which is often written different notation, is that if you take Statistical exponential in some lambda ring of mixed health structures or whatnot. Uh, homology of PGM times BPS of slope mu. Then this is going to be given by um, some direct sum of or more homology, the stack of semi stables. Of this slope mu with some additional factors, normalizing factors. So, if you want one way of understanding what PPS homology is, that there is a, the stack of semi stables, which is, you know, has different homology from the, the word modelized space or intersection homology, it's, it's a different object. If you look at some kind of generating series, including 
the cohomology of the stack. So for us, this will be generating series encoding the point counts of the stack of semi-stables. And then the, that should be equal to a placistic exponential of something simpler of this PPS cohomology. And so in other words, if you take the placistic logarithm of this generating series describing the cohomology of the stack, you obtain the PPS cohomology. So this is how the our main result kind of should be thought of as a, as a local kind of periodic integration counterpart of uh, the BPS point count, whatever this means. How does this differ in the vector space? I mean, it's within this statistic logarithm. Mm -hmm. There's some gradient vector spaces. It's not, it's not, if you want this as a sort of a defining relation. But so in this paper by Kinsher and Koseki, they actually tell you precisely what this is. So in the final case, this is just like intersection homology of the vector space. And otherwise you have to take direct terms of intersection homology sheets where you get contributions from, from smaller ranks. So there's a, you know, there's an ex explicitly defined homology like so now the definition. Yeah, that satisfies this relation. This is not the definition. Yeah, exactly. I think this is in a way like the, what people always wanted it to satisfy. Yeah. And I mean, don't forget two things. So first of all, I'm not an expert on these things. And secondly, um, I'm not a physicist, and I think this is where things come from. And so essentially, we, we're just observing right now. We're not reproving any anything with intersection cohomology or so. On. The periodic integration satisfies the same kind of uh, numerical property, the same kind of relationship with the point count of the stack of semi-stables. So maybe at some point in the future, but yeah, this is to be continued. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm gonna end here. Any question? So if you have a smooth parking stack, yeah. which is a, which does not have necessarily a cross moduli space, do you have a periodic integration? Uh, yeah, so essentially, I mean, so we, we always, right now, we always work in the situation where we have a cross moduli space. But we've looked at some examples too where you don't have a cross moduli space. So that there also there is a theory there for sure. But we're not after after that theory at the moment. But we definitely like in the you know the whole point is that you have to kind of turn this into something more explicit, some more explicit identity. And in fact, we do this using periodic integration on the stack. And so actually, one of the the key points is that we we don't just work with with you know OF points, but actually with somehow we work with root stacks of OF. And this is actually how then buildings get involved. So somehow. Yeah, unfortunately, like roughly a third of my talk wasn't <laughs> wasn't covered today, but yeah, there are buildings somewhere in the picture, I promise. <laughs> you mean Bohatis building? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, Afghan buildings. So like we, we we just need like the classical Goldman Ibahori theories of uh, for PGLN or, or SLN. Yeah. But so the somehow maybe I can quickly say this. I mean, we all know this very well that um this forgetful map from points for discrete variation ring to points of a reflection field. This is usually kind of has finite fibers and it's not one to one. So somehow we actually exploit this in our proof. So kind of we, what we do is like given given a, an F point here, we kind of study the, the set of lifts. So the set of OF modules over the, the steps. If you want this, it's like taking a vector bundle and looking at how many semi-stable extensions you have over OF. And it turns out that this is not just a random set, it actually has some interesting structure. So it actually corresponds to a convex shape in, in an affine building. So it will be, you can actually geometrize it as like integral points inside of a convex shape in an affine building. So it's like a finite union of, of convex polytopes glued together. So in the, in the rank two case, for instance, you would get so the finite trees measuring kind of how many OF models you have. And then in the, sorry, the stirring quant case, and then the rank two case, you would kind of get viewed together like several copies of, of hexagons or something like this. And then integral points inside of those convex domains in the upland building corresponds to how many OF models, how many letters you have. And this is something we exploit in our computations. Yeah. yeah. Another question? And there's any, to do with, with IC in this formula? 
Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. So in hindsight, I mean, a priori, we don't see IC at the moment. We cannot reprove Kinshu and Kuseki or anything like that. Of course, globally, we know that the two things must be the same thing, just because the PID volume is independent of D, and so is BPS cohomology. Would it be the IC of the R space or the IC of the? It should be just IC, like should be related to IC of the cross model I space. Yeah, but at the moment. It's, you know, except for simple examples, we don't have a, anything like a formula that would express PID integration in terms of things like IC, yeah. This seems to be, yeah, just yeah, something we haven't yet had a good idea on, but probably never will, but yeah. Can you apply the same methods in order to study the response of dimension one sheets on Surfaces. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So one, actually one of the, the differences of this project is that, so in the first two papers, we really yeah. used this duality yeah. of the Hitchin preparation. We used that there was a Hitchin preparation, but here in what, I'm, what I've talked today in the second half of my talk, like that you don't need a Hitchin preparation. So these results, they're really purely yeah. local. So yeah. you could also apply it to like modelized spaces of quiver representations, for instance, and things like this. So you, you just need this kind of, Smoothness property of the modelized stack. Right? So you want to work with like fixed bundles of panel mm -hmm. time. It's going to call that Yao or dimension one. Or dimension one, yeah. And then to get to the two color Yao case, um, so at some point in the future, we'll think about this using some kind of potential approach. So using potential. So that should be should be doable for at least you know Higgs bundles of color Yao type. Right? Mm -hmm. Dimension one. Oh, homological dimension one. So, like, whatever yeah. representations. Yeah. Yeah. To get smoothness right of the model I said. Yeah. Like, for, for the expansion we care about and the canonical divisors, that's really the critical phase where it's not satisfied, right? So, that's why you need vanishing cycles and so on. So, you need tentacles. So, this is something we, we hope to look at in the future. Yeah. Smoothness of the algebraic stack, if you need it well. Um, so, smoothness of the algebraic stack is used in the study of when you look at those maps here. So, kind of you, you try to understand the measure here. And essentially, what we have, like we, we show that this map here is a topological topological covering. Like to control and to show that it's actually also vital in a suitable sense, in the sense that it's special preserving the use of the stacks are a small. Yeah. Um, it's definitely needed right now, but maybe not in the, in the future. So then uh, looks like a Thank you.